Okay, welcome everybody, uh, and thank you for coming. My name is Peter Zussi, and I teach here, here at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at UCL. And we are incredibly uh, grateful to be able to host this event, uh, commemorating the 100th uh, birthday of Alexander Dubček, the face of the Prague Spring. Um, I have never done an event like this behind a mask, so uh, <laughs> you'll have to bear with me. Um, we have, uh, what we will do is have some opening remarks from uh, first the director of, of uh, CIS, and then from His Excellency the Ambassador. Uh, and then we will also, we are uh, very privileged to have uh, the son of Alexander Dubček, Pavel Dubček, uh, here by Zoom link. Um, and he will have some words to say. Uh, and then we'll have a, a sort of panel discussion. So that's the shape of the event. The event is both live with you all here, and it is um, being broadcast on Zoom or yeah, through technology. So that's the um, the shape of the evening. And I'd like to start by inviting uh, the director of CIS, Professor Diane Conker, up to say just a few words. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks for sharing the event. And thanks to Jakob and the Central European Study uh, Studies Seminar for, for, for organizing this. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this hybrid event, commemorating the life and the legacy of Alexander Dubček. Peter said, I'm Diane Conker, the director of CIS. I'm very grateful for the support of the Embassy of Slovakia in London and the British Czech and Slovak Association for co-sponsoring this event. And uh, offering this, this lavish spread behind you. Uh, I want to extend a particular welcome to our guests, including His Excellency Robert Andreshik, Ambassador from Slovakia, and Pavel Dubček, uh, the son of Alexander Dubček, who is joining us uh, via Zoom. In 2018, we remember the 50th anniversary of the Prague Spring and its brutal destruction with a photographic exhibit in this same Maserat room with the presence of the then uh, Slovak Ambassador. And I also have personal memories of socialism with a human face from 50 years ago. In July 1968, I was an American college student taking a course on 18th century Britain at one of Oxford's colleges during the summer. Uh, our course organizer, which was an organization called the Association for Cultural Exchange or something mysteriously CIA like that, uh, approached some of us uh, on, on the course to say they were sponsoring uh, the visit of some museum specialists from Czechoslovakia who were benefiting from the Prague Spring to make a study visit to British museums. Did any of us know Czech or Russian? Uh, would we will be willing to join them on a pub crawl along the Thames? So I had some Russian uh, and a great interest in what was happening uh, behind the Iron Curtain in those days, and so I was happy to go along. Uh, I don't remember much of what happened after the first pint or so, but I still have memories of, of the kind of hopeful, uh, uh, collaborative uh, feeling of friendship and, and hope in the changes that were underway at the time in Czechoslovakia. That was July 1968. I'm now old enough uh, that my personal memories have become history, uh, but I feel very fortunate to be able to welcome you to this event, which combines memory and history, uh, and to have a fresh consideration of what Alexander Dubček contributed to the Prague Spring and to what could have been an alternative form of socialism, an alternative path for Europe. Uh, I'm sorry I have a prior engagement and I can't stay for the event uh, and especially the socializing afterwards, but I wish you a very enjoyable and stimulating evening. Thank you, Diane. Um, I'd now like to invite His Excellency, the Ambassador, Robert Andrejczak, of safety work. Thank you. Dear Professor Kinker, your colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to express my gratitude to the faculty, members, and Professor Kinker for hosting this event and for bringing together an expert panel. It's a pleasure and honor to be here today to commemorate and remember the life and legacy of a very special politician in Slovak history and in Czechoslovak history. This year, on the 27th of November, the commemorated 100 years since the birth of Alexander Dubček, one of the most significant and memorable political figures in Slovak and Czechoslovak modern history. 
Dubček was a symbol. Dubček was a symbol for many in the Czechoslovak in then Czechoslovakia. He gave Slovaks and Czechs hope in difficult times. He represented humanism and was a strong advocate of human rights even during the normalization period. The phrase socialism with human face will always represent the period of Dubček's leadership and will remain the symbol of the Prague Spring, Spring in 1968. In 1989, during the Velvet Revolution, Alexander Dubček re-entered the Slovak political life after almost 20 year, years, and once again started playing an active role in, the sh in shaping of modern history of our country and countries. He al he's also well known abroad. Squares and streets in different countries have been named in his honor. His impact and the principles which he fought for were acknowledged by the European Union when he was awarded the Sakharov Prize in 1989, or when he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Bologna in 1988. I am very sorry that the son of, son of Alexander Dubček, Dr. Pavel Dubček, can join us today, us, can join us uh, today personally, but I'm happy that he will be sharing with us his personal experiences and impressions via Zoom platform. I'm also very glad to welcome the representatives of the British Czech and Slovak Association among us, an organization which was launched in London at the presence of Alexander Duk Dubček himself in 1990. I believe that today's roundtable debate will allow us to share our knowledge and thoughts on Alexander Dubček and enable us to gain some new insights into the life and impact of this political figure. In this way, I would once again like to express my, uh, my appreciation to CIS for hosting this event and for joining the Slovak Embassy and the BCSA in commemorating a man, a politician, and a humanist who shaped the history of Czechoslovakia and Slovakia in the 20th century. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is first introduce the members of our panel, and then what we have is a brief film, um, very brief, just a couple of minutes, and we'll show that to you. Um, and then I'll invite our guest of honor, uh, Pavel Dubček, to say a few words, and then we'll sort of let the discussion move on from there. So let me start by introducing um, Pavel Dubček, who's, as you heard, the son of Alexander Dubček. Um, the most prominent figure in modern Slovak history and an icon of the Prague Spring in 1968, as you all know. Uh, Pavel Dubček studied medicine at Komenius University in Bratislava. During, communi during communism, he was not allowed to practice as a doctor. Today, he works as a traumatologist in Br Bratislava, um, and he is the president of the Alexander Dubček Association and still cherishes the message and ideals of his father. Uh, our other panelists, and I'll start here with uh, my colleague, Wojciech Janik is the UCLC Library's uh, Area Liaison Coordinator and Area Liaison Librarian for Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Eurasia. And he's responsible for overseeing academic liaison and coordinate, coordinates the work of the team of Area Liaison Librarians. And we'll be asking him to say a little bit about the sort of collections and holdings that we have here at CIS. Um, in the middle is Dr. Jakub Benesch, who's lecturer in Central European history here at CIS. His first book uh, called Workers and Nationalism, Czech and German Social Democracy in Habsburg, Austria, uh, was published uh, with Oxford University by Oxford University Press in 2017 and is the recipient of three prizes. His current project investigates peasant movements and radicalism in East Central Europe during the era of the World Wars. Uh, furthest away from me is my other further colleague, Dr. Thomas Lorman, who's a historian of Central Europe. Since 2010, he's taught here at CIS, uh, and he's published widely on Hungarian and Slovak history, and also serves as the editor of the journal Central Europe. His last two books are The Making of the Slovak People's Party, Religion, Nationalism, and the Culture War in Early 20th Century Europe, and a History of the Hungarian Constitution, Law, Government, and Political Culture in Central Europe, which he co-edited with Ferenc Hörche. Unfortunately, one of our guests is not able to join us 
uh, Dr. Celia Donard, who's Associate Professor of Central European History at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's fallen ill and so wasn't able to join us here today. Um, so now I'm going to move over to my chair here. And we'll move on to the short film. So as you will have noticed, a French song indicating, I think, quite nicely the international scope of, uh, of Dulcek's legacy. Um, I'd like now to turn to our special guest, uh, Alexander Dulcek's son, uh, and just invite him uh, to open with some words, uh, any impressions, thoughts he might like to share with us about his father and his legacy. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my English is uh, very poor. I need a translator. Thank you. I believe we have one here for you. Politika je, by som povedal, preto potrebujem tlmočníka, alebo Názory na politiku sú veľmi komplikované a ťažko sa vyjadrujú. Politics is very difficult. That's why I need a translator because impressions, opinions differ and are very broad. Po skúsenostiach z minulosti, kedy počas krízy moji starí rodičia boli v Spojených štátoch a potom sa vrátili naspäť na Slovensko, kde sa narodil už Alexander Dubček. Prišla druhá svetová vojna, kde bol zranený a usmrtený Aleksandrov brat. Uh, the World War came where my father's brother well, 
died and was basically killed. Môj otec bol o dvakrát zranený. My father was wounded two times himself. A keď si tak spomínam, aj otec z maminej strany v prvej svetovej vojny nezahynul na pijave. And if I can remember, then he was the father of... <laughs> my grandmother was also uh, wounded and killed in the first world war. Yeah. 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 Tieto obrovské utrpenia zanechali na otcovom srdci pamäťové stopy. Preto jeho srdce veľmi túžilo potom vytvoriť spoločnosť, ktorá by bola humanná a demokratická. That's why in his heart and his uh, he craved to create a society that would be human, a humanist society and a democratic society. V po druhej svetovej vojne uh, veľa ľudí uh, začalo veriť ideálom komunizmu. After the second world war, a lot of people started to believe in the ideals of communism and communist regimes. Ale ako to už v ľudskej spoločnosti býva, uh, každého režimu sa po rokoch chytia chamtiví a bezohľadní ľudia. Otec pomalými krokmi dával dohromady ľudí. A to odborníkov v, v priemysle, polnohospodárstve, kultúre. A približne od 65. roku pripravoval prvé kroky k demokratizácii. Ja si na to spomínam, aj keď nie som politik. I remember this even though I'm not a politician myself. Uh, že nás na dovolenky vodil do rôznych krajín, kde on sa stretával s rôznymi politikmi. But when we were when I was a child, he would often take us for vacations to countries where he would meet with, with a lot of political figures himself and Pamätám si na Tita, Kadara, Čaušesku, ale tie ich rozhovory uh, boli iba medzi nimi. Uh, I can remember uh, Tito, Kadaro, Čaušesko and their, their dialogue, but those were kept between themselves for how these reasons. V 50. rokoch bola veľmi nebezpečná situácia v Československu. Veľa ľudí, ktorí sa pokúšali o demokratizáciu, bolo potrestaných a už nie je medzi nami. A lot of people who attempted and pursued democratization uh, suffered as a result and a lot of them are not amongst us anymore. Preto môj otec s priateľmi pripravoval tieto kroky pomaly, prakticky a bez toho, že by napádal iných politikov, pripravoval program. Uh, and that's why my, my father took small steps that were very practical. 
he did not directly attack any uh, political figures that were out there. Jeho najväčším šťastím bolo, teda, tak by som povedal, jeho najväčšou radosťou bolo, keď ľudia boli spokojní. Vtedy žiaril, usmieval sa. A teda ľudia v 68. roku, pre ktorých vtedy politici pracovali, ukázali celému svetu, že svedomia a túžba po demokracii je silnejšia ako hlavne zbraní. We're able to show that the willpower uh, of the people and the, and the willingness of the people are much much more powerful and stronger than than weapons and armed uh, and armed forces. A vtedy to boli prvé kroky k demokratizácii. Those were the first steps towards democratization. A tie armády ktoré sem prišli zbytočne, ktoré prišli do Československa zbytočne. The armies which came to Czechoslovakia sa vracali domov. Do Ruska, do NDR, do Polska a ja som presvedčený, že to bol prvý pohyb ktorý potom v Rusku uh, začal s postupnou demokratizáciou. A po 20 rokoch nakoniec Pán Gorzavčov povedal, je to vaše dielo a začalo sa to hýbať v celej východnej Európe. Ja neviem, čo by som vám povedal, lebo páni, ktorí tam sedia, sú historici. Ale zistil som, že uh, ľudia a politici niekedy medzi sebou majú informácie, uh, po ktorých po, uh, historici túžia. That historians are striving to, to gain and to figure out. Lebo niektoré stretnutia a závažné rozhodnutia uh, nie sú zapísané na papieri. Because sometimes some of the most important meetings and dialogues are not recorded and they only live in the memories of people. Aj kritika môjho otca, lebo aj doteraz je veľa politikov, ktorí kritizujú niektoré kroky môjho otca. A ja som sa stretával vtedy aj s rôznymi ľuďmi, ktorí hovorili. Kde boli tí hrdino... No? Kde boli tí hrdinovia vtedy, keď išlo do tuhého? Môj otec nemohol dovoliť otvorený konflikt, pretože by skončil veľkým krviprelievaním a ja si myslím, že táto cesta... Uh, 
uh, an open conflict because it would become very bloody. Morálneho odporu bola ďaleko silnejšia ako boj. And uh, the, the approach of moral, uh, moral resistance was much stronger and a wider choice. Zachránila sa komplet inteligencia, kultúra, národa do budúcnosti. The intelligencia and, the basic, and basically the future of the, the country and of the nation was saved thanks to this process. V tej dobe mali radikáli pripravený robotnícky tribunál, ktorý by bol v všetkých odporcov likvidoval fyzicky. Uh, at, this, uh, at this time, the radicals had a set up a tribunal, which if it was allowed, the resistance would be probably executed and taken out. A takto boli prekvapení všetci vojáci a ich veliteľia. And the soldiers and their leaders were also very surprised by this. Ďakujem. Thank you very much. Uh, those comments and the combination of sort of family memories and uh, kind of uh, commentary on your father's legacy are, I think, really, really uh, useful and, and thought-provoking for us here today. Um, I'll, what I'm going to do now is have some questions for the panel members, but Mr. Dubček, please uh, feel that you are part of this panel as well. So if you would like to make any further comments uh, to the questions that come up, just raise your hand and uh, and we can turn to you uh, uh, on the screen. So uh, the first question I want to ask is actually for Wojciech, and just to say something about um, the seize holdings that relate to uh, Alexander Dubček's uh, career and, and sort of what sort of research can be done on him here and, and what sort of resources we have. Thank you very much for uh, So yeah, uh, just, just to find a very small presentation uh, on resources that we had related to 1968 Czechoslovakia and, and Alexander Dubček. Um, just to uh, just uh, to clarify that um, I'm representing my colleague. We have a specialist for Slovakia, Susana Pinchikova. She cannot be here, so I stepped in, and this is a kind of our joint presentation. So this is about the Czechoslovak collection holdings in in our library. So I would start maybe with the, the with the kind of origins of the collections, and basically, our collection is I would say probably one of the best uh, in the Western world, uh, in the Western Europe, and there's no. Nothing strange about it because it stretches to 1915 since you know Tomasz Masaryk was one of the um, founder of the school and since since that time we really had a kind of a good relationship through the, through the whole history with a stream of donations, books, exchanges, and so on. So we see uh, Václav Havel visiting since in 1990, and obviously there was a 1993 there was a split up, but we managed to sort of have a good relationship until now. And and when we as a proof, and we can move on to the next slide and about the donations where. This is my colleague Susana Pichikova with the previous ambassador and uh, the proof that, you know, that the stream of books <laughs> is coming to the library. So this is the, the, the live event. And, uh, but now I would like to just move on to the next one and just to show a little bit about the, whatever we have on, on, on the subject of this presentation. So obviously there are the number of things, starting with books, PhD pieces, journals, newspapers, and so on. So if we can move on just to the books and this is library, which everyone associates the library with the books. So I would say that we have a very good collection of um, the Slovak history and politics. There is a couple of thousands of volumes that we have. Like having, we have them in various languages. So it might be the Slovak language, but it could be the Russian ones on Germans and so on. So we collect them. And it is a really, really good, uh, good collection. Um, so as just an example, so obviously we have uh, Alexander Dubček's um, autobiography here, and also using this opportunity that we have uh, our guest speaker, uh, his son, Pavel Dubček. So if, if someone would be interested in sort of following it up, so we have an oral history, and there is an interview with uh, Pavel Dubček, among others. So we have it in our collection as well. So this is probably one of the, you know, better resources to have a, to have a look um, on that. So I obviously won't, won't, won't say too much about the books, which is quite big, but another uh, area I would like to focus is feces. So we have a large collection of feces, both 
uh, at UCL, and we are subscribed to a number of databases, sort of, or provide them, and we, 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 are, we are able to uh, find PhD pieces, you know, from really Europe. And it is quite useful because it, it, it reflects the latest sort of research, um, uh, research literature findings and so on. So this is a very popular um, resource for our students. So you can move on, it's just an example of, of several titles from various uh, providers. This is one that I wanted to highlight, UCL Discovery, which is uh, UCL's uh, Discovery Open Access, it's managed by library, and basically it, it, it represents the intellectual output of UCL. And as we can see here, so there, there are um, some sort of such, uh, articles, and uh, there's a Peter Jushi uh, article, the, the, Sean Hanley's and so on. So the one with the green padlock are available in open access, so anyone around the world can download them. And obviously, there is a lot of, uh, on 1968, look check, like, for example, the, the PhD pieces, like decision making, 1968, Czechoslovakia, and so on. So this is, so these are the items that we, uh, that we have in the library. However, the, the, the very interesting one I would like to highlight is the journals and newspapers. This is really, really strong uh, point in the library that we have. So throughout the whole history of the, of the, of the school, we were subscribed to a number of journals and newspapers from the whole region. So we have a really nice collection of, uh, the, of journals. So starting with, you know, schools on Slavonic and East European Review, um, the Czech ones, the, the, the American ones. So this is the studies in comparative communism. And there is an article about Alexander Dubček. It's from 1968. So this is a really good collection. And talking about the period, uh, newspapers, as I said, we have a really, really good collection it covers all days, really, from the former Soviet bloc country. So, so we could angle and see, you know, the, how the situation developed, how it was portrayed in various countries in these newspapers. So it's through the Bravo, it's Vestia, I don't know, Polish Tribuna, and so on. So this is a really strong, uh, strong collection. We have it either in print or on microfilms, if it's archived. And, um, but recently, obviously, we are moving in times, and we have a lot of newspapers in digitized format, and especially the English language one. So we have the Times, the Financial Times, Economist, and so on. And this is the, the stretches back, obviously, to 1968, and so on. And so this is where, where academic students uh, can really find all the information that they need for their projects. And uh, I'm very proud of these resources. The next slide just shows uh, one of our suppliers. And uh, the one that I wanted to highlight is the, the Economist Historical Archive. So uh, our, our members so can basically access it from uh, the comfort of their own sofa at home. So the next slide we show, for example, this is the snippet uh, from The Economist, and it shows you know, the, the one dedicated to terrible events of 1968. Um, another supplier is, is, is a very good one, so specializing in Eastern Europe, made predominantly in Russia. And as you can see, we have uh, the English resources like the current digest of the Soviet press. So this is the edition from, I think, August 1968 and the International Affair from, again, November 1968. So you can see how it was reflected in, uh, for example, in the, in the Soviet, um, Soviet press through propaganda or any other angle. So this is, uh, this is something that I wanted to highlight. I also pro, uh, have uh, digital versions of Izviestia. I think this is, yes, this is Izviestia. They have Pravda as well, so people can uh, access them. Uh, easily from home. This is just a highlight of few databases that we think are very useful for our students and have a lot of information about Central Eastern Europe and particularly about Slovakia. So just to, moving slowly towards the end, archives. This is obviously one of the strong points in, in CIS collection. Maybe the sort of Czechoslovakia is not the most, the, the, well, the second part of it is not heavily reflected, but we do have various archival items there. And the highlight, I would say, and very much related to today's event uh, is the, the Frank Carter uh, Frank Carter collection. So Frank Carter was an academic at uh, UCL who traveled to uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968. He visited Plzno, Plzno Eve and Prague, and he brought a number of newspapers. But most importantly, on the next slide, you can see you know, he also took a number of pictures uh, from 1968. So they are in our collections, and we are kind of very fond of that. And, uh, and we digitize them, and I will say a word about it on the next uh, slide. And almost finally, the, another very important and, and kind of a crown in our collection, audiovisual materials. We have hundreds of films, either feature films, uh, documentaries, and others uh, coming from Eastern, Central Eastern Europe. And obviously, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia is well reflected there as well. Um, it is supplemented by recent digital resources, like um, 
the, well, yeah, the, the, this and the, the next slide, we can see that like Bobo, DOB, Bobo, bro, box of broadcast, and people have an access to BBC archive. So they can you an access the um, broadcast from BBC, like from 2008, or, you know, uh, that related to uh, Eastern Europe. And another one is that we recently acquired, a socialist on film, and this is quite interesting because again, it is digital format, and you can you can you know really touch the history, if I may say so. Uh, there is a newsreel from 1968 in Prague. So this is really a lot re uh, useful resources, so that people can focus and 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 study it from all angles and different sources. And really moving to the end, other resources, and uh, so they are open open sources, and basically they are not supplied by us, but. We, as the librarians of the team, uh, myself or my colleagues, we have a knowledge of them. We cooperate with various uh, people across the Europe, different libraries. So we sort of link, we have also a page at, at CIS where we list all these resources. This is, I think, is, um, gosh, I think is the Wilson Institute. Uh, so this is something that, um, that we also propagate. And, and finally, there is a team of CIS library, area liaison librarians. So we do our bit as well to support the school wherever we can. So it's not only books, databases, but there are various uh, events. So, for example, I think 2019, there was a 1989 conference um, for Central European Symposium. So, we prepared an exhibition of various archival materials. And this is the Prague Spring that we did in, I think, 2018. It was the 50th anniversary of the Prague Spring. So, we digitized the Frank Carter's uh, photos and they are available um, in our collection. So, if anyone is interested, uh, you are most welcome to, uh, to follow it. And finally, uh, this is, you know, uh, Cosidis Council for Slovenian East European Library Information Services. It is an association of Slavonic libraries in the United Kingdom. And this library is one of the pillars of that, of that council. And uh, I'm just mentioning it because, you know, it is, it is a very good network of Slavonic libraries or Slavonic specialists. So this is the way that we can also help or direct people. Um, you know, if we don't have something, probably our colleagues will know something or they will be able to update it. So this is, this is in a nutshell, what we have in the library related to uh, 1968 Czechoslovak collection. So yes, thank you very much. If there will be any questions later, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, I'm impressed myself with the talent we have. Um, I think you know this largely uh, relates to a sort of historic connection uh, that the school has had with, as you mentioned, with the foundation of Czechoslovakia. Uh, Masaryk having been uh, a, a key figure in the foundation of this school. So it's a connection we sort of cherish and are very, very proud of. Um, okay, now let's move on to some sort of more general questions about the historical legacy and, uh, and context um, associated with Alexander Kupchak's uh, career and life. Uh, and the first question I wanted to present sort of openly to the panel um, is, is this. Uh, the political scientist Kieran Williams uh, has called the Prague, Squ Prague Spring, and I quote, among the most important events in the political history of post-war Europe, end quote. And I'm just wondering if our panelists agree. And Tom, maybe I'll turn to you first, if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, AJP Taylor great British historian made a quip about the 1848 revolutions, where he said it was a turning point in world history where the world failed to turn. I think there's something that can be said about 1968 as well, superficially, and of course it was a global moment, the Prague Spring was, was merely its, its most extreme manifestation, most dramatic, remarkable manifestation, was that in some sense um, something happened and then it disappeared. That's, 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 that's how one could look at it, from the, the greyness of uh, Novotny to the greyness of Husak, with a brief interlude of hope in between. But if we look deeper, I would say that 68 was a critical moment in the broader understanding of Central European communism. In that A, it devastated the reputation of the Soviet Union, even among communists in Western Europe. So about a quarter of all communist party members in Western Europe resigned from the party in 1968. But secondly, B, 
it demonstrated the essential or at least the perceived impossibility of reforming the system. That is, if Dubček couldn't reform, then the only solution was to dismantle. And the conclusion that came from individuals who pre-68 had dreamt of the possibility of reforming the system after 68 dreamed of its dismantlement. So the 68 is, like 1848, a critical moment as much for its legacy as for what actually happened at the time. Though I don't want to discount what happened, but I think the most critical point about 1968 is the message it sent mm -hmm. to, uh, to both communists and anti-communists across Europe. I mean, that resonates with what Mr. Dubček said about sort of soldiers returning to their own countries with a certain sense of disillusionment about what they had seen and, and, and the kind of impact that that had af afterwards. Uh, Jakob, if you don't mind, actually, Mr. Dubček has his hand up, so maybe I'll yeah, turn yeah, to him yeah, first. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Dubček, please. I was going to ask you about the book on the book that you showed us, because I don't know it. Ak by bolo možné, že mi poslať ten obraz tej knihy. A chcem ešte pripomenúť, ak sa niekto preloží. A chcem pripomenúť, že otec ešte keď žil, napísal autobiografiu, ktorá vyšla v japonskom vydavateľstve Kodansha Incorporation a potom asi v 15 jazykoch a volá sa to Hope Last Dice. Nádej umiera posledná. The English edition. I have it. <laughs> <laughs> A bez ohľadu na to, ako ktorý režim sa nazýva, tak je dôležité, ktorí politici ho vedú. Lebo v histórii ľudstva bez ohľadu na režimy niektorí politici doviedli národy k spokojnosti a k blahobytu a niektorí k vojnám. Takže môj otec sa snažil o to, aby ľudia boli spokojní a mohli po generácie žiť v spokojnosti a demokracii. Uh, yes, so and uh, towards that uh, rich uh, history of humanity, the, that whatever regime, uh, whatever kind of a regime, a regime calls itself, then it always depends on the people and the politicians who lead, who lead the regimes themselves. And uh, because there have been leaders that have turned regimes into prosperous uh, societies, some regimes have collapsed. And uh, oh, Mr. Richard's father was aiming for people to to be happy, to be comfortable, to live in happiness and, and prosperity for generations after him. A ja dúfam, že aj v našej civilizácii sa nájdu politici. And he hopes that even in today's uh, world and in our society, civilization, ktorí dajú národom vzdelanie a kultúru, aby sme na tejto planéte mohli ešte veľa rokov žiť.
for our scientists to live prosperously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, in many ways, you've already anticipated what my next question is. Um, but before I raise that next question, I just wanted to give Jakob uh, a space if he wants to talk about uh, the question about the importance of the Prague Spring as, as a political event. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll say a couple of words. I mean, I think um, uh, Tom said something very important, which was um, uh, the failure of the Prague Spring was really um, a milestone in um, attitudes both east and west towards Soviet style communism, um, even more so than 56 in Hungary, arguably. Um, the late historian Tony Jutt um, makes the Prague Spring the centerpiece of his uh, chapter, The End of the Affair, in his monumental history of post war Europe. And, yeah, I mean, I think that's that that um, that kind of turning point that fails fails to turn is 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 a good way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, at the same time, the idea of of reform communism itself we could be called an important event in po political post war history, um, which you know before August twentieth um, was a very interesting idea. And I actually I, here at UCL, I, I teach a, a history course called a global history of socialist ideas going from 1800 uh, and, and the very earliest so-called utopian socialist ideas of Robert Owen and Fourier and St. Simon and all the way through to the 1980s. Um, and uh, the only idea that I have from Eastern Europe really in the 20th century or Central Eastern Europe um, after uh, the Second World War is reform communism. And I think it, it, it was a kind of event thinking that you could, um, uh, uh, you know, still have a one party system, but somehow liberalize it and open it up to dissenting views. Um, so I, I think in, in that sense, um, you know, intellectually, uh, not looking past its failure in Europe, it was, yeah, a, 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 a crucial event, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you all sort of anticipated my second question, which was um, to ask about whether the sort of ideal of socialism with a human face is still relevant in any way. Um, in, and not, I guess the sort of point of the question is not, is there a relevance beyond the fa its failure? Um, do you think that there's, uh, any reason why we should care about this today, aside from the fact that we have this example of it didn't work in that context? Is there any way of thinking of this as, as kind of a current um, ideal uh, in, in any shape, do you think? Uh, can I answer? Yeah, please. I think it, it, it's very interesting what you're saying, yeah, that, that, that reform communism is a, is a is a, is a legitimate ideology. I think it is, but I also think it's an attitude. It's an emotion. That I, I sometimes forget how young Dubček was yeah. in 68. Yeah. You know, he's 47 years old. You know, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, was the first American president to be born in the 20th century. And in a part of the Kennedy's appeal wasn't just what he what he did, it was also that he was young and fresh. And I think that's why Dubček, to some extent, uh, captures the spirit of reform so well. He's young, he's engaging. I'm sure Dr. Dubček could talk about this, but he has a, he has a way of engaging with, with ordinary <laughs> Czechs and Slovaks. He has a passion to his speech. You can even sense when he's crying when you listen to some of his speeches. Um, he has a vigor and an energy um, to him that I think is part of the, that socialism with which we face is to say that politics can be energetic, um, exciting, it, it, that, that it doesn't have to be a gray, dull thing. Um, and I actually think about Dubček that his perhaps closest comparison is with Gorbachev. 
in that both men are trying to recapture some of the, the energy, uh, the vision, even the Leninist moment when the world seemed possible. And so that, well, as I'm not sure that socialism of a human face as a, a human face as a direct ideology is going to come back. Though the social democrats often do something quite similar, but they've always been doing something quite similar. Um, but what I do think is that the energy and vigor and excitement of politics that Dubček had in the 68s can be brought back. That has a legacy. I mean, to some degree, that's the ideal of authenticity, which is always that sort of uh, intangible aspect of politics, because so much about politics is about manufactured authenticity. And every now and then, a figure comes along who breaks through that and feels truly authentic. And I think that may be uh, sort of related to what you're talking about here. Yeah. And the um, humanity is a part of that. Yeah. The, yeah. That, that, that real sense of humanity, I mean. Yeah. 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 Jakob, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, a lot of half thoughts, really. Um, probably nothing as, as, as eloquent as, as what Tom just said. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, socialism with the human face, it was, it was, of course, you know, belonged to its its, its moment. And, and then when it sort of seemed to come back in the form of Mr. Dubček in 1989, it seemed to be a real anachronism. You know, it seemed to be, it seemed to belong to the past. Um, now, you know, more than 30 years after uh, 1989, um, some of the kind of assumptions of that moment of the Velvet Revolution um, have been questioned, have been rethought. And um, I mean, obviously, you know, that's we, we don't have one party states in Europe, and that's, I think, a good thing um, overall. Uh, on the other hand, you know, that I mean, I guess sort of it, putting in different words what, what, what Tom said, I mean, that, that, that ability to kind of, um, and, and, and what you said, Peter, I mean, that ability to, or, or that impulse to kind of take decision-making um, to ordinary people and encourage sort of grassroots participation um, in, uh, you, you know, the state, whatever regime there is, and and uh, in in political decision making. Um, I mean, I guess you know that's a very broad lesson, but it's it's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and and the state uh, after after um, decades of it sort of withering away and globalization also you know seems to be um, on people's minds as making a potential comeback. Um, but how can it sort of be? How can it be um, inclusive and participatory? I guess is 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 a question. You know, if it if it sort of if if we kind of um, uh, uh, sort of resurrect it in some ways. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think thinking back on the opening remarks from Mr. Dubček is something he said is very relevant here in terms of its kind of legacy, which is, you know, Prague Spring may not have been successful, but the manner to with which it responded to aggression, I think, is something that was successful. And that sense of a kind of moral resistance to open arms um, is something that is remains very much uh, an ideal. And actually, um, Mr. Dubček has his hand up. Uh, so perhaps we can turn back to you, Mr. Dubček. You have the floor. Ja by som chcel takú spomienku. Nešlo tu o názov socializmu s ľudskou tvárou. Ale o ľudskú tvár. A ja but, vám poviem prečo. But it was about the human face itself. Treba si všimnúť program, ktorý za tým bol. We have to look at the program that was behind, behind this race. A ten, a ten bol sloboda tlače, vzdelania a viery. And that was the freedom of press. To bol ten program, za ktorý môj otec bojoval. Freedom of press, religion and uh, everything. And that was the program that uh, his father fought for. 
a nemohol to nazvať inakšie, lebo by uh, skončil vo vezení. My sme v tej dobe žili, ja som bol študent a videl som, že uh, za týmto cieľom Išla, išli nielen občania, ale aj armáda a všetci občania. Media, noviny neboli obmedzené, mohli písať. Ľudia, kresťani mohli chodiť do kostolov. A vzdelanie začalo byť dôležité. A to bol ten cieľ, o ktorom aj otec hovoril, že And that was the goal, uh, which my father uh, called. A povedal, že politika je pre mňa služba občanovi. That's where it's father politics is, a, uh, is something by which you serve the people and their citizens. A on nikdy nezabudol na to, že bol krstený aj veľmi často sa stretával s kňazmi. A tieto humanné ideály boli v ňom. Len s odstupom času mnohí to hodnotia zo svojho pohľadu a neuvedomujú si, aká, aké to obdobie bolo nebezpečné. Ja ešte, ja ešte ako mo, ak môžem, tak spomeniem si na obdobie, kedy z nás zobral otec na dovolenku do Jugoslávie. A to nebola náhoda, lebo sa chcel stretnúť s Titom. Bolo to v 65. roku. A ja som ho ako chlapec kritizoval, že otec, aké je to hrdina, keď má koberec do vody, aby ho neboleli nohy. A otec mi povedal, Palko, on už teraz má svoj vek, ale je to človek, ktorý dal Jugosláviu dohromady. Je v Európe uznávaným štátom. Uh, a country which is acknowledged in Europe. To bolo v 65. roku. Ano? 65. No a povedal, že Palko, keď títo zomrie, Jugoslavia sa rozpadne. Tak môj otec nebol až taký naivný. Ten 
Thank you. I'm gonna. I, I had a couple of further questions, but I actually I think I'm gonna skip them because we've. I'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience, um, and as well to um, to the wider audience on the other side of the Zoom screen. We have some questions um, that have come through. Uh, the Zoom, and I will uh, get to them, and actually some of them overlap with what I was planning to ask, so that's worked out quite nicely. But I'd like to first, uh, yes, uh, take questions here. Yes, sir. Okay, um, uh, I think I should thank uh, Alexander Dubček for making the most um, pertinent uh, comment on the 2014, the first Scottish independence referendum because uh, in 1992, he, he made a statement that uh, certain things that appeared to be failures uh, in actual fact turn out to be uh, successes because they set a process in motion. Now, in 2014, I knocked on the door of a certain cultural institution in Bratislava. Um, I won't mention it because the people I spoke to are quite well known. I won't mention their name. Um, and I was surprised at how interested they were in, in, in by the time we exhausted the subject, I mean, we're talking about Slovakia. They, these three men, messaged me that they were part of the Russian generation, uh, in that they had been educated after the invasion, and that their education had had a lot of Marxism in it, and because it was imposed, they rejected it all. So it's 2040, so after 25 years of so called freedom, there was a mine. We, we now believe that Marx was right about many things. I'm also, I, I'm doing research on, on, on visual and, and musical culture in Slovakia in the 20th century. And um, so I, I go to Slovakia very often and I, I, I have conversations with hundreds of people and I've been surprised at how many times people have proffered to me the idea that communist ideal is something they agree with. You know, I've been very, very surprised. Um, and, and I kind of counter this by, by referring to 1989's second novelization. Because whatever hope, and it was indeed a lot of hope, and I don't think it's over, uh, 1968 brought, you can't say that uh, the neoliberal capitalism that we're living <laughs> under today is it in, in any way um, a successful outcome of, of the ideas of 1968? Uh, thank you for those observations. Does anybody want to refer or respond to that? Can I just say, I mean, there is no doubt an understandable nostalgia for some elements of the communist system across Central Europe. And a recognition that it had some strengths. But I also think that there is another story here, which is the remarkable success of Slovakia since communism collapsed. That it has uh, achieved a peaceful uh, independence that is now firmly established. It's demonstrated its democratic vitality, it's experienced a tremendous cultural flourishing, economically absolutely top class. Bratislava, parts of Bratislava are as rich as parts of London. I think it's one of the success stories of Central Europe. And while I understand the nostalgia you're saying, it's not the, nostalgia. The, or a thing, but the voters, I think, have made it quite clear that the communist system pre 1989 uh, is one that they're very happy to be got rid of. Well, so would I, of course. Okay. Yeah, no, I think it was not the was not the, the, the you know, normalization, it was not the one thing, it was uh, something else. Um, yeah. No, I think, there, yes, I'll just make one comment and we'll take your question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between nostalgia for the old thing and the idea of a sort of, and I, of course, encounter this, especially among students very often, the sense of some kind of ideal and the feeling that that you know, whatever existed in the 60s was was not it. Um, so it's not nostalgia for that, but it's the sense that there is something um, that can be inspiring to them for the future. That's, you know, it's a, there are lots of generational aspects to this that are, that are involved. But yes, sir, your question. Yeah, so I would like to ask uh, anybody here who actually was there through 
1968 with the surprise spring. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, I come from Central Prague. Uh, my family, I would like to refer to my colleague behind, was persecuted for 30 years because we believed in God. I had the same profession as Alexander Dubček, storing his army chief because I couldn't study. I couldn't have a higher education. My, I was told from the age of seven that the only future I will have is either bricklayer or a miner. I would like to tell you that I followed the philosophy of Alexander Dubček with a human face, and I have become quite successful in Britain. I couldn't go home for 20 years because I was sentenced in my absence for believing God. So let's look at this idea of 1968. I went to all his lectures, always smiling. He was a happy man. It oozed out of him, the happiness. The only time he was stuttering and he apologized was in his famous speech on the 28th of August, 1968, when he asked people to be cautious, not to rebel, to prevent bloodshed of the nation. And then all the Czech radios broadcasted. We agree with that, but we will not submit to dictatorship. And the legacy of Alexander Dubček is every politician is now Alexander Dubček. Because what's the most important part of every politician today? A human face. I uh, was born in the same year as Paul, his son, 1948, around the same age as him. And I can tell you that every politician now works on the legacy of Alexander Dubček, supports charity, doesn't want to be controversial, preaches that it's good for all. And I disagree with you who said that Prague Spring was failure because it was success. He came back in 1990 as the head of the Czechoslovak parliament. His legacy, he had to wait for 20 years to fulfill his legacy. And I can tell you that another thing is needed, and that is capitalism with the human face. Well, I have a good news for you. On the 14th of December this year in the House of Lords, I'm receiving a prize for responsible capitalism from the ex-Lord Chief Justice, Igor Judge. And the panel who voted for me was out of 1,000 people. And all my work, I provide people 25,000 with jobs. I build houses built by apprentices, which allows people to save money through the rentals. I have farms which are ecological, hotels which work on a geothermal power, Marcus Rashford came to my resort 10 times, but he was a footballer. I built the first football stadium, which saves 27 tons of CO2. So I can tell you, for me personally, Price Spring was extremely successful. And I couldn't even go to a funeral of my father. I slept in front of the embassy for three days in a car, and they gave me a visa. In 19, my father died 30th of May, 1989 few months before the Velvet Revolution. And I waited for three days, only to get the visa two weeks after his funeral. So I can tell you, Alexander Dubček was a giant. He was a man who, at the end, won. Prague Spring has won, because people need to have a human approach to politics, human approach. And he was the one who wanted to narrow the gap between the ruling party and the dictatorship and the ordinary people who suffered. Well, today, I think, if the world does narrow the gap between rich and poor, we are about to face the same problem as a Sprite Spring in 1968. So all I wanted to say. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I mean, I think that that accords with what Mr. Dubček said, that it was about the human face as much or more than whatever sort of noun came before that, socialism or, or, or otherwise. Um, and that, you know, clearly is a legacy that, that remains extremely inspiring uh, today. Um, 
Uh, we do have some questions that have come through the internet. Um, is there anyone else on the uh, sort of here who would like to? Yes. Yes, yeah, just to uh, concur with what uh, Jan said, and of course what uh, you were all talking about. But I think an observation that uh, there are two strains of the same thing. One is the political beliefs, uh, which combine quite well with uh, the humanity, and then there is the humanity by itself. You know, and uh, I think that we can't really talk about one without talking about the other. And it's uh, true that somewhere in between, you are going to get a better civil society if you observe those rules, some of the rules that uh, Jan was talking about. Yeah, thank you. Let's go. Um, could Mr. Kupchak say something, please, about his father's attitude towards the independence of Slovakia? Oh, interesting question. Yes. Um, Mr. Dukcek, would you like to say uh, some words about your father's uh, thoughts and attitudes towards the independence of Slovakia? Mm väčšinou sa otec o dôležitých veciach nerozprával s deťmi. A nikdy ani nekritizoval politikov a nerastol na tom, na ich chybách. Uh, at the same time, he also, he also never really criticized politicians and political figures, whether public or private. Ale viem, že jeho názor na rozdelenie Československa mi povedal, že je to ešte veľmi skoro. Uh, uh, his opinion, which he told me about the a rozdelenie ešte nie je pripravená, pripravené. A bolo politickým rozhodnutím a nie rozhodnutím občanov. Ale to je môj názor. One is a, a question that uh, is for all of the panelists that is about uh, again, Dubček's legacy more broadly. So the question is, um, can you say anything about Dubček's legacy beyond the former Czechoslovakia, in particular, how he's perceived in Russia and the former Soviet Union, which uh, is very close to a question I had uh, written down, which is, how do you think his legacy is understood by most people today, and do you think it's fair? So maybe I'll start with you guys. Looking at me. Well, okay. Uh, I, I I don't know what to say about how his legacy is perceived in uh, the countries of the former Soviet Union. Honestly, um, I think his his legacy um, in uh, let's say the Czech Republic and particularly Slovakia um, uh, has changed. As I said earlier, I mean he was viewed in 1989 as a sort of uh, an, an inspiration, but also a kind of an an anachronism, someone who belonged to the past and not so much to the present, except to kind of draw some continuity with that former flowering of political consciousness and activity in 1968. Um, but I think since 1989, I mean, Dubček's um, uh, uh, importance in, um, uh, and meaning in, in, in Slovakia has, has broadened, actually. I mean, just several years ago, the, the, the government of Slovakia instituted uh, a, a 
uh, Alexander Dubček State Prize, right? That, that has an extremely wide um, uh, uh, potential um, uh, coverage in terms of who, who can get it. I mean, it's it extends to sort of, as far as I can tell, to, to people in academia, artists, um, uh, people for their achievements for the economy, also people who raise the profile or contribute to Slovakia's reputation abroad. Um, so that's that's quite quite broad, really, and um, and I think it's testament to to maybe um, a, a kind of a kind of. Uh, view of, of Alexander Dubček as, as ranking among kind of the great Slovaks of Slovak history in general, although maybe that kind of, um, that, that, that diversity of things that he's associated with shows that people aren't quite sure where to place him too. Um, so, so a kind of, uh, a, a, a kind of sense that, that he's extremely important to Slovak identity, but also maybe not quite sure, a sort of lack of clarity on how exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's my brief comment to that question. Yeah. Thank you. Tom, do you want to say any words to I also can't speak to how he's viewed in the former states of the Soviet Union, but I can say that his critical and long and important life, you know, going back to his participation in the Slovak National Uprising, uh, his role in Political, political developments, the 50s and 60s, and the legacy that he had, and again his reappearance in 1989. And all of that means that you can't write modern Slovak history without, without discussing Dubček. In fact, I don't think you can really write modern Central European history without mentioning Dubček. And, and with that, and as a vehicle to discuss a great deal. So I think he's become... Uh, a figure who is now central to the story of modern Europe, and that's 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 an impressive achievement. Well, that um, sort of resonates with what Jakub was saying about the role he plays in uh, Tony Judd's yeah. post-war book, which has been so influential. Yeah. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions on the internet that are specifically for Mr. Dubček, and since it's really lucky of us to have him here, I'd like to focus on those a bit. Um, so, Mr. Dubček, one uh, uh, participant uh, through the Zoom has written, really lovely to hear from Mr. Dubček here, personal stories and memories behind our own Slovak uh, man respected by many who shaped Czechoslovak history and tried to actually think of people rather than his own status. It's tremendous to have you here, and I wonder if there is any family memory or story about this your your father that's different from the historian's point of view so i think this comes to the question of what you were saying the kind of difference between uh first hand personal uh interactions with a figure of this importance uh as opposed to the historian's account mm -hmm. is there anything that that you might be able to share with us a sort of family story or something I mean, you shared a number but is there anything you'd like to to add uh, question. Najvyšším cieľom môjho otca už od detstva bol nielen rodinný život, ale aj okolie. Preto jeho najvyšším cieľom bol dôstojný život človeka, ako vravel. That's why uh, his goal was the respect, uh, respectable life of A preto tieto hodnoty, bez toho, že by niekto ich nutil, ocenili aj v iných krajinách. Napríklad si vážim, že v New Dealy pomenovali po ňom ulicu a nikto ich nenutil. 
he appreciates the, the fact that there's a street named after him in Delhi and no one forced them to do that. I Ankare, I have Kyrgyzi, I have Australi. In Ankara and Kyrgyzstan, all around the world. Že tie hodnoty, ako on vravel, že politiku robí nie pre seba, ale pre ľudí, by si mali uvedomiť viacerí politici na svete. Pomínam si, že mi dával za príklad takých politikov ako John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Olof Palme, Mahatma Gandhi a vtedy som si uvedomil, že všetci títo ľudia tragicky skončili. Aj Dubček tak skončil a vtedy som si uvedomil, že v ľudskej spoločnosti sa dobro robí horšie ako zlo. Možno som to tvrdo povedal, ale treba si pozrieť ľudskú históriu. Dúfajme, že nájdeme cesty k sebe, tak ako opakujem, aby naša matka Zem nás tu ešte nechala. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll have one more comment, then I think we can continue the, or two more comments or questions, uh, and then we'll continue the conversation over uh, reception there. So I have a brief question. Yeah. Have a, a good check. Yes, please. Um, in, in the uh, Ludovic Fuller Museum in Zomburg, then there is a photograph of Alexander Dubček with the artist uh, of Fuller. So um, one of the things that irritates me when I read uh, about that, uh, I told you to check there's a number of people who say, oh, he was not an intellectual. So my question is, um, did he have any art, Slovak artists that he particularly appreciated? Did he listen to, to music, Ujin Sukho, or uh, Ilya Zelenko, or Hannah Egorova? Yeah. I'm not sure if you could hear that, uh, Mr. Dubček, but the question was whether your father had particular artists and musicians that he was uh, fond of. Hej, samozrejme, to som zabudol povedať, u nás v rodine, aj v okolí, bývali rôzni umelci, aj bežní ľudia a otec sa rád s nimi stretával. On sám rád spieval, Hral na mandolíne. Chodil nielen na športové zápasy, ale veľmi často sa stretával s, s umelcami, s hudobníkmi. A vážil si históriu každého národa, tú pozitívnu. A keď boli významné udalosti aj z dejín Slovenska, nezabudol ich nikdy navštíviť spolu s občanmi. 
and whenever any important events were being commemorated that happened in the history of Slovakia or any other uh, country, perhaps uh, he would always make sure that he would go there, and especially that he would go there with the citizens and, and appreciate it with them. No, preto opakujem, že kultúra a vzdelanie je poklad každého národa. It's not really a question, it's more a comment, sort of. I emigrated in 1968, so I still was there partly when Dubček started. And I can only say that we were a nation, although I was younger, but I still knew already enough and I started to work. Nation who was a trotting on, depressed, uninterested, completely downtrodden, Nothing could be in, of importance, nothing can be done about anything. Let's forget it if things are collapsing in a, nothing, nothing can be done. When Dubček came, it was like a miracle. Suddenly the human spirit, the resilience became so obvious. People completely changed almost overnight. I remember uh, there were some, there was some, he wanted to build something, there was some shortage, uh, but there was a shortage of finances. People started giving their own money, even those who didn't have anything even gave into the state coffin, so to say, their own rings when they didn't have any other provisions. It was, unbe it was an unbelievable change. And I wanted to stress it, this is really a legacy of Dubček to show that human spirit doesn't die so easily. On the other hand, I can't link it because I don't have time. But, uh, so I want to mention, but there was, there was no talk very much about economics. I think at that stage, I don't know, maybe somewhere it was, but not, uh, people were aware of it very much. And therefore, when I then came, stayed in England here, not for political reasons, only because I couldn't, make a decision to return back into this sort of depressing society because when I was here already, the, the, it was suppressed, the Dubček era, era was suppressed. Now, but when I then heard people on the television, some repre representatives from the Czech uh, Prague Spring saying that there is nothing wrong with communism, it's just people are applying it badly. I was terribly upset and angry because it is absolute nonsense. The part of the whole thing is that if you want to distribute property equally among all citizens and want to maintain it like this, you have to suppress this, you have to, you have to install a suppressive society. It cannot exist naturally because people are so different. And some people have, can, like uh, here, uh, Mr. Kalinsky, he, he came here with nothing and he is now I mean, here. I am homeless. I lived yes. in a cemetery for 10 days in a sleeping bag, two pounds in the pocket, and no people. English whatsoever. And I couldn't go home for 21 yes. years. Uh, and I'll tell you one rule, if you excuse me. This was the slogan in 1968. Don't say anything. If you say it, don't write it. If you have to write it, don't sign it. And if you sign it, don't be surprised. <laughs> Now that was the society in 1968. People were downtrodden. Uh, your, my father would tell me, this is what it is, but please don't say it at school. Don't say it anyway. So you lived in a society which was totally broken, totally depressed, and the only time people have time to express themselves when they have their dacha, their country home, where they could play. And then when they come home, it was a total suppression. So Dubček was the one who changed it. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to finish, but people cannot be expected to, to be, they, there cannot be an equal distribution of property and it cannot be maintained without some force. 
So it to say we can have a communism with the human face, but to my mind, is a nonsense. And I want, but I also want to say to this gentleman, I think Marx has to be left out of it. Example, it's different between Marx, difference between Marx, between Lenin, between start between communism and all these sort of things. Because even I, who, who, who am totally against communism and you know communist econ economy. Marx actually, when you, when you look into market economy, market economy, you start wondering how much but Marx was, was actually right. So these things are extremely complex. And I think Dubček has done enormous thing showing that you can't live for, for a long time under constant suppression. Yeah. Well, I think May I just say, I thank yeah. this gentleman for his kind words about Slovakia and about what it achieved. Because when you look at BBC television and present some presenters like Michael Portillo, whom I really like, and Michael, uh, what's his name, Palin, whom I really like, it seems as if they have been given instruction. You have to mention Slovakia because it is on the map. But say about this as little and as fast as possible. Don't spend any money and time there. Don't introduce it to the Europe and to the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, thank you for those comments. I mean, what I, what I think is a very uh, perhaps fitting way for us to round up this discussion and move to the um, to the reception is exactly your comments about the, the, the tangible sense that uh, Dubček's uh, arrival on the political scene in 1968 had on people. I think that's very valuable sort of testimony. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to wrap this up now. Thank you very much for joining us today and sharing um, your memories and your thoughts. Uh, it's been a real uh, pleasure for us to listen. Thank you to the other members of the panel as well. And thank you to the audience, both here and online. Um, so, uh, We'll continue the discussion now over a glass of wine and refreshments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.